its two years on the air, Al Jazeera America has presented a list of very impressive documentaries, some of which have won Emmys and Peabody Awards. The latest documentary, a two-parter, premiered last night. It's called Freeway, Crack in the System. It's all about a person, well, some might call remarkable, some might call despicable, and others might call both. It deals with Rick Ross, out of Los Angeles, who in the 80s and the 90s was one of the most prohibitive dealers of crack cocaine. He has been in prison now for the last two decades, and what he has done is nothing short of transformational. Here's a bit of what went down last night in Al Jazeera America, part one of Freeway, Crack in the System. You know how they say that everybody has a purpose in life? Well, at one time I felt that selling cocaine was my purpose. We were starving, just looking for a way to, to succeed. The first time I seen rock cocaine was 1980. Murder rate was sky high. South of the 10 freeway was kind of a no man's land. So, you know, we're selling it to the blacks. So you go to these neighborhoods, you, there's no cops, you can sell them where you want, and when they start killing each other, nobody cares. I was going through like a million dollars worth of drugs just about every day. That's like gold. We can make a fortune. He was maybe the biggest guy in LA. Rick, Rick. Freeway Rick. Freeway Rick was getting his dope from a very big operator. I think we're into something that's bigger than us, something we really can't deal with. They had been trafficking on behalf of the United States government. She could prove what she was saying. The story was mind-boggling. When I was young, let me tell you how it was when I could. As I've said before, no government will remain alive. There's a lot of people who think that, you know, I made that whole thing up. What they don't realize is the CIA admitted it. See, I didn't know until I was sitting in prison how valuable an education was. Yeah, drugs suck. Drugs are really bad. But the drug war is worse. You want a new version of hell to be the only guy playing straight in a dirty card game. And that's what the drug war is. There are more people in prisons and jails today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Me being here is defying all odds. People don't get federal life sentences and beat them. We've been spending billions and billions and billions of dollars every year on this war on drugs to find out that the government was involved. That's pretty astonishing. Crack in the system. This is Los Angeles. Even if the government just turned a blind eye and didn't do anything about it, then you have to start questioning the whole system. Crack in the system. This is Los Angeles. The last piece of music you just heard was written and performed by Snoop Dogg. Our next guest is the producer and director of this two-part special, which continues next Sunday night at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. He is considered one of the foremost documentarians on the subject of urban life. Several years ago, his series, Brick City, on Sundance Television, won many awards, including the prestigious Peabody Award, considered the best in television. Joining me here in New York, another simulcast exclusive, Mark Levin. Mark, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Simon. Good to be on. How did Freeway catch your eye? Well, uh, you know, this is a story that I've kind of been involved in personally in that uh, I was a young producer for Bill Moyers back in the 80s and w was at the Iran-Contra hearings uh, when Ollie North testified. Uh, and I worked on the, uh, the classic show, The Secret Government. Um, so that's where I first heard stories about uh, CIA, cocaine, the Contras. Uh, ten years later, I made a series that also won the Peabody Award for Discovery called um, CIA America's Secret Warriors. And that's uh, when Gary Webb broke his uh, Dark Alliance story. And uh, I ended up meeting Gary, and Gary put me in touch with Rick, who was in prison at the time. Uh, and we started corresponding, uh, speaking on the phone. Rick and I hit it off for a number of reasons. One was funny is that he was a tennis player, and I happened to be a tennis aficionado, and he constantly was challenging me to come out to Texarkana, which was the federal penitentiary he was in, uh, where they had one tennis court, and he was going to show me how good he was, and I was a middle-aged guy, and he was going to take it to me. Uh, I finally did make it out to Texarkana uh, in 2006, uh, sadly, the Bush administration had closed down the one tennis court because they thought it was a luxury the inmates didn't deserve. 
But Rick and I spent a day together, and uh, that was where we started this discussion about a documentary. Now, Rick was serving life without parole. Uh, but he was incredibly optimistic that uh, he was going to win an appeal and that he had found case history to back him up. And I have to say I was impressed by his enthusiasm, uh, his uh, self-taught knowledge of the law. But uh, being a realist, I, I was like the chances of beating a federal life without parole sentence is, you know, one in a hundred. Um, but three years later, in 2009, I got a phone call, and it was Rick, and he said, I'm on the bus home. I told you I'd get out, and you better get your butt out here. Let's get to work on that documentary. So uh, that's kind of the way it all started. It took uh, four or five years to put it together because uh, it is an epic story. And it's uh, what's always attracted me is that, in a way, Rick, as a, um, just his own story, touches so many of the elements that we are still dealing with today uh, that it gave you an opportunity through a narrative and through a human story uh, to kind of touch on how did we end up with this mass incarceration, so many people of color behind bars, how did we end up with the militarized police, how did we end up with the Crips and the Bloods going from local gangs to becoming inter you know national gangs, how did the weapons uh, you know, military-type type weapons get in their hands. Uh, how did uh, gangster rap culture spread? All of these things came out of L.A. and came out of this story. And ultimately, Mark, this is as much a personal story as it is an issue story. Here is someone who in the 80s and 90s considered reprehensible for what he did distributing crack cocaine, first in Los Angeles, then around the country, and upsetting so many lives in the balance. And yet now, here is someone who has had this stunning transformation, now remorseful for what he did back then, and to the point where he's now helping his fellow prisoners, uh, at least when he was in the last latter half of his prison term, to become literate, to try to become as productive members of society. Uh, for you, when did this life turn? When did this life become transformational? Well, you know, when I was... Uh talking to Rick before I even met him, he was asking me for books. He was asking me for books on mergers and acquisitions, books on finance. I, I was stunned. And that's where he first told me the story that he was uh, illiterate uh, and that he had learned to read in prison, which I found stunning. I was like, what? You were making millions of dollars a day. You were buying shopping centers. You know, you were in the middle of all this and you didn't know how to read. And he said, yeah, in fact, I remember an anecdote where he told me he was once in a, a, a real estate office and they were going through the contracts and he would look around the room and look at the lawyers and see when they turned the page. And then he would turn the page just because he was pretending that he actually could read the contract. Um, so I, I was aware uh, and I was sending him books, uh, but it wasn't until I actually saw him speaking to young people uh, and saw the, they were mesmerized by his story of his redemption and his turn and how, when he grew up, I mean, the idea, as he says in the film, I never read a book until I was 28. I never wanted to read a book. In fact, as he says in the movie, the thing that motivated him to finally say, I better learn how to read, was when he asked his lawyer, how did I get a life without parole sentence? And the lawyer said, here, just read these two pages. That'll tell you. And, of course, he couldn't read those two pages. So uh, it's an incredibly moving story. And, sadly, uh, it's a story that so many others have lived. I mean, 60% of the inmate population in the United States is functionally illiterate. Uh, so it is uh, quite a sight when you see how Rick can talk to at-risk youth uh, who are struggling with these issues and how he can make a connection. And that is, of course, the positive side of this story. Mm -hmm. How long did it take to put this all together, and how did this get to Al Jazeera America, which is, uh, in the last two years, really built up a very impressive list of documentaries. Fault Lines, which is sort of their world front line, if you will, uh, has already won several Peabody Awards, uh, a few News & Doc Emmys, uh, is really considered one of the top documentary series on television. Yeah, uh, the, this took about uh, four or five years. I mean, this is uh, uh, because it's pretty much was a passion project and was uh, self-financed. Uh, but um, I was, it's funny you mentioned Brick City. 
uh, some of the executives at Al Jazeera America were fans of Brick City, uh, and they were looking to do something similar. Um, and that's how conversations began with them. Uh, and at some point, uh, I said, hey, I got this other project. I wonder if you'd be interested in looking at a rough cut. And uh, two of the executives uh, said, hey, that sounds interesting. And I showed it to them, and they loved it. Uh, so that was kind of how the, the relationship started. And uh, I certainly give them credit for being bold and, you know, not being afraid, because obviously another side of the story is the whole g- government uh, complicity, the Reagan administration, the CIA, uh, where you have, uh, you know, an administration on one hand telling young people in the 80s just say no to drugs, and on the other hand saying we just don't know about uh, the drug dealing of our anti-communist allies, which, of course, was a lie. Uh, so that that is, uh, you know, still there's heat around that. That's what that movie that came out this fall, Kill the Messenger, uh, the Gary Webb story, was all about. So I give them credit, you know, for not being um, intimidated and being willing to tackle a subject like this. We're speaking with Mark Levin. He is the producer director of the new documentary that premiered last night on Al Jazeera America. It's Freeway Crack in the System. Part two will play Sunday night, same time as last night, 10 p.m. Eastern. That's 7 p.m. Pacific time. Mark joins me here in New York this half hour on Tomorrow Be Televised. Simon Applebaum here with you live from Brooklyn Pennant Media near the Barclays Center. If you have a question or comment for Mark, don't be shy. Ring in 646 652 2906 or use our chat room, Simon Apple 04 by name. Travel Channel launched a new series later this month that may be the most unique it's ever done. It's called Breaking Borders. It teams a journalist, it teams a chef, and they go together to some of the world's hottest hotspots and try to bring people together. Breaking Borders will premiere later this month. We'll speak with Bruce Brian Leonard. That's Brian Leonard. He's the executive producer of the series. Exclusive interview next Monday right here on Tomorrow Will Be Televised. Mark, how do you balance the personal story and all the other topics uh, to, to put together the mosaic as a whole? Simon, you just hit the, uh, the million-dollar question. Uh, it was very perceptive because that's a question I would ask myself every day, uh, both during production and sitting in the editing room. Uh, it's, I don't know that there's a, a formula, a secret formula. Uh, it's uh, a lot of trial and error, a, a lot of collaboration with others, uh, you know, screening cuts and seeing how people react. But my point is that you, you put your finger on what, was the real creative challenge in a project like this, was to keep it a human story, and uh, an amazing human story, and yet not make it a biofilm. You know, there's so many of these issues that intersect with this life, uh, and finding that balance, uh, you know, I was always concerned. Uh, that maybe it was too much Rick story. No, now it's too much, uh, you know, political issues, cultural issues, even the, even the hip hop story, which you know is a whole other story. In other words, the fact that there's a rapper out there, a very successful rapper, Rick Ross, uh, who took the name, and Rick had challenged that and had gone to court. And when I used to ask some of the young people that work at our studio here, um, you know. Have you ever heard of Rick Ross? Of course, they were all like, yeah, I love his album. And I'm like, no, not that Rick Ross. And they were like, oh, there's another one? So for for a younger generation, that was actually a way into the story, is who did he name himself after, or whose name did he take? Um, so, yeah, that, that was... That was the trick, and uh, as I say, it, trial and error, and uh, you know, just trying to see, and I hope we found the right balance. Well, going back to Brick City, uh, for me, and I had a chance to see that program, it was on two years on Sundance, I think one of the things that I think people came away was they got knowing to see uh, Newark as an urban story, an urban life story, but they got to see the individuals who were out there trying to make that city better. And it seems to be a part of your work, which is to try to showcase not only the issue at hand, but also the people that are trying to better the system or better the environment they're in. You're right, Simon. That is uh, definitely uh, something that it seems I've been in the middle of. It's uh, it's a trick. You know what's funny is uh, when you go pitch these things to executives, like Take Brick City, for example, uh, 
you know, they look at you, and they're, you know, turning a city around, you know, you sure you, you shouldn't be at C-SPAN, and, you know, who's interested in that? And then it's like, well, wait a second. If, you know, you guys are interested in somebody turning their life around, uh, or, you know, if they're overweight or if they're uh, alcoholics, you know, look at all the programming you've got on that, and then turning their family around. And why not turning their neighborhood around or turning their community around? Uh, because it is, in the end, individuals on the front line who really do make a difference. And that is something that has attracted me. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and I find that, you know, the the if you can find that right hybrid, that right mix between the personal and, let's say, the political, uh, you get a lot more people tuned in. They're not put off by what they'll see as, oh, this is just educational or political or propaganda. And they're not just lost in the, let, let, let's say, it, the celebrity days of our culture today where it's just all focused on personality and, and bio. You know, somehow you connect it to, and that's how we all live. <laughs> we all have our lives, we're, we're lost in them, and yet, you know, we know they intersect with all these issues that affect us, the economy, the, the, the environment. These are things that impact all our lives, but finding ways to bring that alive, that's the trick. Now that several years have passed since Brick City, any plans to maybe do a follow-up special and uh, find out not only where the city is at, but where the people you met are? Uh, well, it's funny. That's what we were talking to uh, Al Jazeera America about, and uh, we're still having some conversations because one of the more militant leaders and the principal of um, Central High School, Ross Baraka, uh, son of uh, the famous poet Amiri Baraka, is now the mayor of Newark. Cory Booker went on to become the senator from New Jersey. So you do have one of the most uh, certainly uh, militant uh, you know, mayors in America uh, now in charge of New Jersey's largest city. And, of course, you have a governor from the opposing party who has gotten a you know, tremendous amount of attention is still trying to see if he could be a candidate for president, uh, Governor Christie. So I think that could be fascinating to go back. Uh, and uh, not only the political situation, also obviously trying to find some of the characters like Jada and Creep and, and, and others, you know, to see where their lives have led them, especially her kids. We have a few more minutes with Mark Levin. He is the award-winning documentary producer-director of Freeway Crack in the System. Part one premiered last night on Al Jazeera America. Part two is this coming Sunday night, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Mark's here in New York with me, here on Tomorrow Be Televised, first Monday after New March. Happy you're with us. 36 degrees, by the way, at the top of the hour. We are, yes, above the freezing line here in New Weber, York. We hope that uh, other places in the Northeast as well have been dealing with rain and snow and all sorts of other stuff, particularly the cold uh, the last month or so, are uh, coming back into the warmth. Uh, if you have a question or comment for Mark, get in now, 646-652-2906, or use our chat room, Simon Apple 4 by name. Uh, any early reaction to last night's uh, presentation so far? Well, one of the things that's amazing is, yeah, we, the film was invited uh, just now to uh, go down to Selma for the 50th anniversary of the March on Selma, which is going to be this Sunday. Uh, the president will be there. Uh, you know, there's going to be over 200,000 people. And uh, uh, part of the Jubilee 50th celebration, they show films. And they want the closing film on Sunday evening to be freeway crack in the system. Uh, so that's kind of amazing. Uh, and what's interesting is how this connection that actually Common and John Legend made during their, uh, you know, tremendous performance uh, on the Oscar show, uh, where uh, John Legend spoke to the whole issue of uh, mass incarceration and how Selma is now connecting the civil rights movement of a half century ago to the struggle of so many today, this issue that so many young men of color have been locked up for years and years, and this criminal justice system needs to be reformed, and this war on drugs needs to be ended. Uh, and that is fascinating. I have to say I was surprised that, uh, you know, they would invite a film about, uh, you know, the king of crack, uh, who was obviously reformed, but still that they saw this connection uh, between what was happening 50 years ago in the civil rights struggle with what needs to happen now in this kind of post-Ferguson uh, Black Lives Matter movement. What do you say to people who, even after seeing this documentary may still come away with the thought of there is no way 
I can forgive this person, Freeway, for what he did to so many people selling crack. What, what do you say to them? I say I understand them. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, there are people like that, and certainly those, and I, part of the way I got into all of this stuff is as a teenager, I had friends that went down to drugs. They lost their minds or their lives. Uh, and I know how deeply that hurts. So uh, I know, uh, I, I empathize with people like that. At the same time, you saw the film, and what's remarkable is that some of these characters who were involved in the spread of crack and the, and the whole trade, they themselves became victims, not just of the criminal justice system, but of seeing the poison and what it did to people, people that they loved, you know, people that were part of their family. Um, so I, 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 the only big picture is that the whole idea of drugs and dealing with the abuse of drugs as a criminal issue uh, is a huge mistake that we've repeated, like prohibition with alcohol. And I think it's summed up best by uh, one of the uh, guys out of the Drug Policy Alliance, Tommy McDonald, who says drugs are bad, but the drug war is worse. Uh, so that, you know, it, it, you can't excuse what happened and, and what some of these people did. Uh, and I certainly understand that. But you've got to understand that the way we as a society have dealt with it only made it worse. And you've got to work to change that. And on that note, we will let you be the judge, especially if you get a chance to see the second part of Freeway Crack in the System. And they're going to repeat the, Simon, they're going to repeat the first part also, so you can see the whole thing next Sunday from 9 to 11 here on the East Coast. So part one will be Sunday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. That will be 6 to 7 p.m. on the West Coast. And then part two, the second half of this documentary, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on Al Jazeera America. AJ is available nationally on cable and satellite, including including on Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Verizon Files TV, which also takes this network, Brooklyn Independent Media here in New York, Uverse, DirecTV, and Dish. So check your local listings for where the network is available near you, or if you want to find out specifically where it is, go to www.aljazeera.com forward slash America. I'm sorry, that's uh, backslash, forward slash America. That's www.aljazeeramerica slash aljazeera.com. Let me say it again www.aljazeera.com slash America. One more time, www.aljazeera.com slash America. Mark Levin, thank you again for being with us. All the best with uh, part one and two of your special and many, many more great things to come. It's a pleasure to have you on. All right, Simon, really like it. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. You're okay, welcome, take you. care. Mark Levin, joining us live from New York.